Um, I am just trying to share screen. It won't let me okay. present. I'll um. We'll just wait for a couple of more people to come online. Um, and then it, it won't let me present. Okay. I think Aaron would need to be made a presenter or an owner. How about that now? Yep. Work, yeah. Okay, look, we might, um, we might kick off and um, welcome everyone to this webinar. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm meeting with you today on the lands of the Ben Wurrung people of the Kula Nations, and I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, a few uh, people who have registered and are online today. So Mayor Tracy Roberts of the City of Wanneroo, Mayor Anne Ferguson of Mount Barker District Council, Councillor Peter Maynard of Wyndham City Council, and Chris Eddy, an administrator at the City of Whittlesea. Uh, I'd like to welcome all councillors, CEOs and, and staff and officers from our NGAA member councils across Australia. Um, an apology uh, from Matthew Deeth, our chair, who um, is going to try and join us as soon as he can. Uh, look, I'm really pleased that we're able to host this webinar and bring you some expertise from Deloitte today. Um, really, the budget um, seemed to have a, a sort of a low energy level as it was being delivered in the House on the 11th of May. And um, I suppose some of the things that are coming out of it really of interest to NGAA are around the housing stimulus packages, um, infrastructure investment, job creation, and it's just the projections on population growth and migration as well. Um, it's also really important in this week when Victoria has gone back into lockdown uh, to remember we're still in the middle of the pandemic and there are still many opportunities to reimagine and reshape how we recover from COVID. Uh, in fact, earlier this week, uh, the Chair, Councillor Deeth and I were in Canberra to meet with parliamentarians and departmental officials. And we came away with some really clear directions of um, how we can best leverage the next election to achieve policy gains for growth areas. And we heard that the election um, is expected to be called as early as October. So we were also able to convey during that visit um, that while we welcomed the new infrastructure funding announced in, in the budget this year, um, it really only covered a small number of growth areas. And we're increasingly concerned about the boom in residential construction um, that is being expanded, um, but without the supporting infrastructure being planned or funded alongside it. So this all ties in well with our speakers today who'll give us a deeper understanding of where we are headed economically and how we can start to refine um, our thinking about how our cities could, could and perhaps should uh, function in the future. So we'll start by hearing from Aaron Hill, a partner at Deloitte Access Economics, who'll provide an overview of the budget. Some of you will recall Aaron from our budget webinar last October. So you'll know that he leads the economics practice team in South Australia and Northern Territory. He works extensively with all levels of government on urban transport and technology economics. And he's originally from the city of Playford. <laughs> so um, well, I'll follow up after Aaron, um, just to give you a bit more detail about NGAA's um, analysis. And then we'll hear from um, Mahid Jamal Dean, an associate director from Deloitte, who um, leads the urban and regional policy team in New South Wales. And he'll present his paper on reshaping cities and regions to drive COVID recovery. So during the presentations, please make use of the Q&A function. Um, we'll have time at the end of the three presentations for questions. And so now I'll hand over to Aaron. 
Thanks so much, Bronwyn. And um, yes, uh, I, I am originally from the city of Playford, um, but uh, I'm currently in the city of Adelaide. And so I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging that I'm on uh, the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects uh, to both them, but also to any other um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining us today. Um, the the um, budget, um, uh, my presentation is going to start with a bit of a discussion about where we're at in terms of the economy, and then we'll head into a bit of a discussion around how the government has tried to respond to, to, to some of that um, uh, uh, following. And, and so um, the, the where we're currently at uh, in terms of um, the economies, we're in a um, phase of um, bouncing back quite quickly from uh, the, the economic challenges that we faced as a result of the pandemic last year. And so um, with, with, with special thoughts in mind, of course, to all of our friends um, who are toughing it out in Melbourne um, and in Bendigo uh, at today, the, the um, key to managing the economic recovery has always been um, making sure that we can maintain control of the virus. In, in, in Australia, we've um, enjoyed rare success around the world in terms of how successfully we've been able to manage the virus. And so what the, um, we're, we're seeing is as a result of that is that we're bouncing back uh, quite fast um, and enjoying quite a si significant recovery. And that recovery um, in, into this calendar year um, it will be quite robust. And, and so, um, as you can see on, on the screen now, um, we're seeing one of the biggest um, recoveries that we've ever seen, um, certainly since uh, we, we've, we've collected these sorts of records. And that's, that's because the downturn that we faced was quite significant as well. Um, and uh, a quick shout out to uh, all of our Business Outlook subscribers who have already received this data. All of this data um, that I'm talking about here comes from our Business Outlook product, um, which um, many of the uh, NGAA's members are, are subscribers to. So thank you for your support. Um, so this sort of really quick bounce back comes as, uh, as, as, as somewhat against human nature. So it, it, as, as people and, and as, 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 as human beings, it's really natural to get uh, stuck in an idea that um, when you're in hard times, it's you sort of emerge really slowly. So, you know, keep continuing with the metaphor of, of a cold or a, a virus. You know, when you when you get a when you get the flu or a bad cold, it might take you for a few weeks to start to feeling a hundred percent again. Um, that's not actually how um, economic recoveries tend to work. And so the way that um, economic recovery tends to work, and, and this is something that I, I talked about the last time um, I, I presented on the budget, but we're starting to see it, see it happen in, in our lives, is that you tend to have quite a fast bounce back. And so once you've got the stimulus, you start to see um, relatively fast growth in the immediate year that follows a recession. And, and some of the economic performance that we're currently seeing um, directly connects with that um, in the market. And so um, as resources are freed up, as um, people are able to shift to, to new opportunities, the economy is able to catch up some of the growth that it lost as a result of uh, the, the, the downturn. So, um, just to think then about where we're likely to see that growth in calendar year 2021. Um, we think at the moment that um, the, a lot of the sectors where growth is likely to be focused over the next calendar year are those that were more affected during the crisis as well as agribusiness. And so um, at the moment, our forecast is that we're likely to see a really strong bounce back in the hospitality sector um, and a really strong bounce back in terms of arts and recreation. And so because they were more affected by the crisis, there's some base effects. So obviously they, they were harder hit in 2020. And so their, their recovery um, is partly off a lot of a smaller base, but also partly the fact that we're starting to see businesses reopen and, and, and activity start to flow as, as the way that capital in our economy changes. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind here is that our forecasts, like those of Treasury, are uh, based on the assumption that um, there's no significant um, outbreak of the virus. And so, um, you know, hopefully um, the, the, what we're seeing in Victoria is a, is a temporary blip and, and you know, everyone seems to be 
acting really responsibly, getting the virus back under control and, and making sure we do what we can um, to, to, to maintain control of the virus. Because that's obviously a really important predicate to, to getting the hospitality sector back open, getting arts and recreation back open. In terms of sectors that might face a tougher 2021, um, as you would expect, um, international education um, it continues to be really um, hard hit. Um, I, I've recently done some work with the, the South Australian government, the city of Adelaide, in particular, looking at that, its effect on inner city CBDs, um, but where it's a little bit more of a focus than perhaps in some of the growth areas. Um, but international education continues to be a really significant challenge just in terms of getting people back on the ground. Um, and, and, and one of the things um, that, that, that's been an important uh, challenge for that sector is that even though in 2020 we weren't able to get new students here, we were able to continue many of the students who were in, already in country. So the virus hit at about March and so many students were already in Australia. That, that, that we're now seeing um, the drop off in commencement um, because new students aren't able to join um, join them. So, and the, the commencements that are taking place are of course taking place online. And so we're not seeing the flow on benefits of international education to those to, to, to the economy. So education um, is, is, only, is forecast to modestly grow, keeping in mind, of course, that the education sector as a whole is much larger than just international education, but it, um, it's relatively constrained. We're also forecasting relatively constrained growth in terms of in pub the public sector in manufacturing, um, and uh, in, in both those cases, it's, it's, it's partly a base effect, but also yeah, the public sector didn't shrink in, in 2020. Um, and then in, the, in manufacturing, it's a continuation of some longer term trends. How's that growth then distributed across the country? And the, the thing that's really interesting about the distribution of that economic growth is that it's the areas that were more hard hit in 2020 that will see a bigger bounce back in 2021. And so um, places like, of course, Victoria, uh, which was hardest hit in 2020, we're forecasting to enjoy the fastest growth in, in, in 2021 as um, Victorians get back to business um, and, and, and we start to see um, some of the, the uh, the, 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 the growth um, bounce back there. Um, whereas um, play, play places like um, the, the ACT and the Northern Territory, which were less hard hit, um, won't enjoy quite as fast growth. Um, important to note, um, uh, if there's anyone from the city of Darwin or, or the city of Palmerston on the call, um, that uh, the Northern Territory, are, we are forecasting a fall in a gross domestic product. That's largely to do with export factors, to do with um, activity that's occurring um, uh, it, 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 that doesn't necessarily affect the underlying demand in the economy. And so um, a lot of the NT economy is really driven by resources. And so the, the extent to which that really would translate on the ground is a bit limited. Um, it, then it, there's a group of states then in the middle. So uh, Western Australia, South Australia and Queensland, uh, where we're forecasting well above trend growth, but perhaps not quite as fast as the eastern states where we're seeing the, the, the catch up, the, 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 the harder catch up. So um, we're seeing, um, we're forecasting quite significant growth in you know, that, that, that middle tier of the, the sort of medium sized states. Um, it, speaking about population, I'm, I'm not going to go through population in, in as much detail as I did in our previous conversation because I think um, broadly things are essentially as we discussed in October um, and Nahid's going to talk about population in more detail in a slightly different way so I, I, I thought I wouldn't, wouldn't labour on that but um, to reiterate what I said in October, uh, we're going to be about half, half a million smaller um, then in 2022 than we thought we would be pre-COVID. Um, but we're going to see a bunch of people rush back into the labour force. And so when we're seeing significant improvements in terms of the labour force um, quite quickly. Um, and, you know, hope it's, it, our current forecasts are for unemployment to stabilise at about 5.5% by early 2022. We're actually already starting to see ABS labour force results that are in that ballpark. Um, I actually, uh, so, so if anything, um, the like, current performance of the labour force is, is at somewhat outperforming these couple of month old forecasts. And so um, there, there's certainly encouraging signs about that, that, that labour force performance. Um, now that, that's sort of the frame of the budget. Um, this is uh, 
for an economist a deeply comforting image because uh, unlike last year where the, uh, the, the, the treasurer delivered um, the budget in crisis in spring, he delivered it uh, this year in autumn. And so uh, this is in front of the budgetary at Parliament House, um, and, and so which is our classic, classical uh, return to, to ordinary order for, 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 for economists um, at, who are happy to see us, us get life a little bit back on trend. Um, and I think that um, when I talked to you in October, we talked about how the biggest challenge that the government really faced was this idea of that businesses, business confidence and business investment was really struggling. And, and I think that um, Deloitte's latest CFO sentiment report is in line with most of the other business confidence surveys has shown that, um, that the, both the, the previous Commonwealth budget, but also um, the improvement of the economy since then has, has really resulted in a very significant turnaround in business sentiment. And so business in sentiment and in investment and in enthusiasm is back. There are some measures in the budget that continue to support some of that um, sentiment, uh, but uh, ultimately um, there's an extent to which uh, the, the mission has been accomplished in terms of solving that business investment challenge that we saw in the previous budget. Um, which brings us to, 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 to the government and, and where things are at today. Um, the, the underlying cash deficit um, is forecast to be $107 billion, which is about 5% of GDP. Um, the, 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 that number is um, important. Um, the, the journey of how we get there is, is perhaps even more interesting. And so um, the chart at right on that slide shows where we were at in, in December and where we're at in May. And so what we can see is that um, the government's undertaken um, some new tax spending, um, some new um, fiscal, sp fiscal spending, so actual government spending, um, and that's um, had a, um, a, a, you know, increased government expenditure by the, the tune of about um, 90 to $100 billion. Um, but then in response to that, or not necessarily in response to that, but um, uh, in addition to that new expenditure, um, we've seen a significant improvement in the um, parameters um, around the economy. And so um, the e economy is improving faster um, than we thought it would in December. And so as a result of that, the Commonwealth is, um, it, it is enjoying uh, a, an upside effect in terms of its tax take. That's particularly true around um, the part of the tax take which is reliant on iron ore. And so iron ore is uh, currently, uh, uh, enjoying uh, some very sky high prices and um, iron ore is a very important uh, factor in terms of the ultimate uh, uh, Australian government uh, uh, fiscal uh, revenue and so um, to the extent that, uh, that we're, there's a sensitivity towards the iron ore price uh, we're seeing a really significant benefit to, to Australian government coffers at the moment and so we're seeing an uplift in terms of what we're forecasting for the, um, for the tax take um, and uh, a, a very modest uh, hit to, to new expenditure from, um, from, from some of the ongoing fiscal challenges. And so as a result of all of that, um, the new spending, new activity, um, we end up at a point which is roughly even to where we were um, when the, the previous um, mid-year fiscal outlook was released back in December. So. Um, the net debt um, in, in nominal terms is, 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 is going up uh, to about $900 billion um, by the end of fiscal 23. Um, that's very much higher than it was forecast to be back in December 2019 pre-COVID. But the, as I emphasised last time, and it continues to be true, I think, um, we need to make sure that we're putting that debt uh, into context. And so the opportunity um, that exists um, for governments at the moment is that we're able to make investments both in supporting our economy and, um, and supporting future economic growth um, because we have access to funding which is vastly cheaper than it was um, pre-crisis. And so, um, and, and I think that this is a particularly striking statistic for those of us who've cared about fiscal policy for some time, is that Treasury is forecasting net interest payments in every year through to fiscal 25 at about 0.7% of national income. That's less, less as a proportion of national income than we paid in 2019. So we just invested to save our economy 
and we've been able to do so without in, in, increasing the interest burden to us over time. And just, I just think that that's a fantastic reflection um, of, of the capacity that we've got to spend at the moment. Now, that capacity is not unlimited. Um, I, I don't subscribe to some of the uh, more niche theories about uh, monetary policy. And so I, I do definitely do subscribe to the idea that um, we, we, we're limited and ultimately we have to service this debt and we're constrained by, by debt. But um, it, it's, it's, a, it, it's a symbol of the fact that um, we, we, we've, had, we've made the most of our access to cheap capital to support our economy through the crisis and to continue to invest in economic growth. And that was the right decision um, made by both state and Commonwealth governments. So let's get into the bit of the weeds of the budget. Um, so I've, I've got, got an unlimited amount of time, so I'm just going to highlight some of the, the, the key themes. Um, the, uh, the, there continues to be um, significant support for um, a lot of the, these tax measures. I know that uh, in some of the growth areas, um, investment in things like medical and biotechnology manufacturing is something that's really important. Um, I know that uh, it's certainly very important out north um, where I'm from in, in Adelaide, but I know it's also important in southeast and Melbourne and, and places like that. Um, and so the, the patent box, I think, is particularly interesting policy um, there where the government is essentially incentivising um, new um, patents um, to, uh, to, to come to Australia. And that creates um, interesting opportunities um, for for businesses in places like that. Um, then um, more broadly, um, we're, we're seeing um, significant uh, in investment um, in infrastructure, education and health. Um, there was a specific aged care package as well. Aged care um, is an important part of the infrastructure mix um, in the outer suburbs. Uh, it's, it's a place where there's potentially some gaps and, and, and some increased demand. And so uh, I know that, that that's something that's particularly important in, in, in the outer suburbs. Um, uh, the, uh, the, there's also been significant investments around um, get, ensuring that women um, in, enjoy greater security in retirement as well um, and, uh, and the return of the women's um, budget statement. Um, I think in response to um, that some of the challenges that women in particular face um, during the pandemic, um, uh, which uh, is a topic um, that we, our business is thinking a lot about um, in, in terms of how we can um, better balance uh, from a gender perspective. Um, so there's a few issues in the budget that I just thought I'd draw out in particular. The first of those is Bronwyn flagged is infrastructure. Um, and uh, the, the infrastructure part of this presentation is always a test of my knowledge of geography across Australia and the, the knowledge of the outer, outer suburbs in each place. Um, but uh, a bit, it's a bit of an inverse. So the way the budgets work is they tend to, they, uh, infrastructure and budgets tends to favour um, particular regions and particular stakeholders uh, in one budget and favour the opposite stakeholders in the next. And as Bronwyn flagged, um, this is probably one where it's, 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 it's the, the infrastructure isn't quite hidden uh, the, the, those the regions in a way that uh, it may have in previous budgets. Um, but uh, the, the, and, and the regions that are benefiting here are a little different to the regions that have benefited previously. Uh, probably the big winners are South Australia, Victoria and New South Wales. Um, the, the largest single investment to the $2.6 billion for the North South Corridor in, in my home state of South Australia, um, which um, uh, will be uh, known to any South Australians on the call as probably the, the biggest infrastructure problem in the state. Uh, so that basically the, the big road from the, that, 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 that sort of tracks Adelaide linearly. Um, beyond that, um, there, there are significant investments um, in, in Victoria in an intermodal terminal for Melbourne, a $2 billion investment there. Um, $2 billion for the Greater Western Highway, a little bit beyond the, the growth areas, but perhaps the very edge um, of some of them, I don't know how close people are to Katoomba, but it's, it's, it's a little bit beyond um, Sydney Basin. Uh, that's that the, the, I think that you, you've got um, that, so, some investment in the Great Western Highway there. Um, but there are then um, some $100 million level investments in infrastructure across the, a lot of the growth areas. Um, support for urban public transport um, in uh, multiple states, uh, you know, whether that's been MetroNet in um, Perth, um, support for um, commuter car parks in Victoria, support for uh, uh, Great Gold Coast Light Rail, um, two different projects there that have had more support from the, in the budget, as well as Gawler Liner electrification through uh, my old something ground in the city of Playfair. 
the, so the, the, the significant um, investments in infrastructure, this, it's, it's not the core of the budget perhaps as it was um, in, in October, uh, but uh, I think that it'll be interesting to see as well. Um, there's a significant number of decisions taken, but not yet announced. Um, it's been a topic of some public discussion. One would expect that uh, as we get closer to an election, that uh, we'll perhaps see um, some continued investment in infrastructure projects from a, from a Commonwealth government. Uh, uh, so I, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, say that uh, all the chickens are necessarily hatched. Um, the final thing I just wanted to talk about briefly was Home Builder. So I talked about Home Builder in my previous presentation to you about um, the, the, the last budget. Um, and I flagged that it was going to be a really interesting issue for um, growth areas. And I think that that's really come to pass. And so the, 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 the overarching conversation here is why? The, the reason is, is that the program design really points to the kind of houses which are built in the growth areas. So. Um, the property price caps actually have subtly changed throughout the program. They're now slightly looser in New South Wales, so that some people were able to get in at a higher price than 750. But the broad parameters at the start were new home as a residence at 750 um, and some fairly tight income test caps. That really pushed people uh, into the, 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 the pushed the program into the growth areas. Um, that was especially true uh, in, uh, in, in southeast Queensland, Perth, and Adelaide. And so you can see it right, um, the number of applications by region. And so um, South Australia, for example, is about 10% of total applications while only being about 6% of the population of Australia as a whole. Queensland's larger than New South Wales. And so you can see as a result of this that there's a disproportionate effect of that program in the medium-sized states as, as opposed to, to New South Wales and Victoria. Um, though, of course, Victoria was... Um, the, the largest state um, by some margin um, there. So it, it still had an important effect in Victoria, but perhaps a disproportionate effect on the markets in, in Brisbane, Perth and Adelaide because of that price point. Um, though I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it had a very, very significant effect in places like Milton and places like Pakenham and Crandon as well, because that, that's very attractive price points um, in, in that out, outer suburban part of Melbourne. A bit trickier in the city basin, I think. Um, so I'm just going to leave it there. I've actually managed to go slightly over, so my apologies, Bruno. <laughs> and uh, it was a lot of content. Um, so I, 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 I'll, I'll hand to you, uh, and then hopefully um, I haven't wasted too much of Mahid's time at the back end. No, no, that was great. Thank you so much, Aaron, for um, for that overview. I will just uh, share my screen, and I've just got a few points to make about. Um, about the different elements within the budget. Uh, so I suppose four things that we looked closely at, and that is one is around the population growth and, and really looking at these projections for um, in a few years time when migration will resume and even exceed pre-COVID levels. And, and so for us, that's going to be a really interesting scenario because um, our members will know that population growth has not decreased in, in, in growth areas, predominantly because of those housing stimulus packages. So um, we know that um, there are still missing links in the data for population projections. And, and this week, earlier this week, we've started conversations with the Centre for Population in Treasury to try and get the numbers right so that when state and federal governments are planning infrastructure based on population, um, they, they can actually have access also and consider the data that local government has um, to give a real, um, a real indication of what's happening on the ground. So we know that um, you know, the, the population projections will be based, won't really be taking into account all of the boom from the housing stimulus packages. And so there'll be an even extended lag time between when people arrive in a new suburb and when the infrastructure is delivered. So that's one area that we're looking closely at. The other one was, um, and thanks Aaron for that um, great slide on the infrastructure spending. So we have to remember it wasn't that long ago that all of the big announcements were made. So of course, 
this budget, there, it was a bit of a top up, I suppose. And, and I liked your point, Aaron, about the, the cycles of who gets funded for, for what. But um, in terms of some of the local government focus, um, there was a really strong sentiment that if it's not shovel re ready, you use it or lose it um, in terms of local government funding. Um, the local roads and community infrastructure program extended, and, and that's really, that's great. But, you know, we're looking at 500 or 400 and then 600 million um, across all local government areas across Australia. So, you know, when it boils down to it, um, that's not the sort of quantum that growth areas need to fix their infrastructure problems. Some of our members did get some great announcements, so well done to all of you and, and to some great advocacy that I know has been happening over recent years. Um, where we're headed with this priority is to really try and quantify and, and, and show the evidence for that infrastructure lag. Um, we'll be continuing to advocate for the more integrated strategic planning to, to look at how, um, you know, the types of broad range of infrastructure that communities need um, as they're being planned and built, not 15, 20 years later. Um, and, and to back that up, we're going to find some positive examples of when, um, when funding has been received and the, and the positive impact it has had. So this is, a, this is something that we'll be looking to our members to provide case studies and we'll commission someone to sort of pull them together to show whether it's an investment in, you know, some industry support or um, co-working spaces or congestion reduction, what impact that has actually had on communities and economies in growth areas. And um, I'm starting to give a bit of a plug for our symposium, which is coming up in July and August, and there's more information on our website. We do have a couple of really fantastic papers on innovation in local government infrastructure delivery. The third um, point that I wanted to make was about all of the housing stimulus. So it um, was announced you know, last year, it's been expanded and there are some new systems coming through, um, through this budget. Um, and it's led to um, you know, some data that we put together with ID is that it's led to a 34% increase in building approvals in growth areas. Now that's an enormous amount and that's on you know there was a slight dip in 2020 um, but we're certainly a third higher than um, or close to a third higher on 2019 levels so pre-COVID levels um, so again that lag time between you know we're really sort of perpetuating that situation of rapid greenfield development without supporting infrastructure um, the, both um, you know there are some uh, public housing funding announcements. The ALP came out with some strong uh, policies around social and affordable housing. We'll, we will be exploring that um, in some papers at Symposium as well. And then the last element that's important for us is around um, employment. So some continued support for apprenticeships, um, for job trainer. And this is our moment, and I think this is where we tie in with what Mahid's going to talk about is, this is our moment to really um, reimagine where the employment centres are in our whole metropolitan area. So um, we, we know there's some great opportunities in working from home. We also know there's an enormous youth demographic that will be ready for employment and skills and study, um, further study in the next um, few years. So um, certainly the ARP came out with their 10,000 renewable, um, renewables apprenticeships. So again, there's opportunities there for growth areas to sort of package up their offer. And, and part of that is their enormous um, young, um, soon to be entering the workforce and labor force. So again, we've got issues looking at this in, at symposium and at Congress, which will be held in November um, in Melbourne, we will really be taking that blue sky view of um, in reimagining, reshaping, reforming, um, repurposing cities. Uh, how can all of this lead to our objectives, which are living, um, living in growth areas, working in growth areas, and loving life in growth areas? So um, they're, they're the main points that I wanted to make. And um, I know that we're sort of running 
a little over time. So what I'll do is I'll I'll just hand over to Mahid now because I think there's a nice um, synergy um, to go through and then we'll wrap up at the end with some, some Q&A, but um, I'll just hand over to you now. Thanks, Bronwyn. Uh, I think Aaron, you might have to share the slides tonight if that's okay. Just on mute as well there. Thank you, Aaron um, and Bronwyn. Thank you again for having us along to this session. Uh, so my name is Mahid Jamaldeen, for those of you who, who, who I've not met, an Associate Director based in the Sydney team. Uh, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live. Despite the excellent uh, virtual background there, I am working from home. Uh, I have fooled many a client and a colleague uh, in the recent past. Um, and, and I live and work in uh, uh, Gadigal uh, land in the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to all traditional owners um, past, present and emerging and those who are also present on this call. Uh, so um, recently we released a um, thought leadership report uh, that looks at uh, how reshaping our cities and regions can help uh, our COVID recovery. Fortunately, uh, as, as Aaron was talking through the, the budget, fortunately Australia has come out of uh, the, the COVID recession in, in decent shape largely because our health response has been quite strong. Uh, and obviously, uh, as we're finding out rapidly, uh, a good health policy and a strong health response equates to a strong economic policy and a strong economic uh, response. So that's been really good to see. Uh, so uh, the, the main point we wanted to make in this particular thought leadership report that was that uh, the idea that cities are our, uh, cities and our cities and our regions are engines of economic growth and we have to think carefully about uh, the role our cities and regions can play in our COVID recovery and how we can set our, ourselves up uh, to be um, better for the future. Uh, so just on this slide, I, I wanted to give everybody a bit of a sense of uh, where Australia is in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things and, and where uh, our cities are. Uh, so 40% of modern day Australia's population resides in, in Sydney and, and Greater Sydney and Greater Melbourne. Uh, and un unsurprisingly, around half of our nation's GDP come out of these two cities. Uh, this is this is a bit of a bit of an oddity because uh, many of the other major cities in the world don't uh, take up as much of a share of GDP as uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, second, the next slide, please, Aaron. And uh, that sort of leads us to this, this, I think a really interesting question as, a, as economists would think about it, is there such a thing as an optimal size of a, of a, for a city or a region? So in, in our analysis, we've, we, we haven't just focused on Greater Sydney or Greater Melbourne or uh, Greater Adelaide or Perth uh, as, a, as a single entity. We're, we've instead gone into the, uh, the cities within these cities. So uh, as you might know, uh, cities are dynamic systems and uh, no city is a homogenous entity and with it, within uh, any given city, not just in Australia, all around the world, uh, there are many cities operating within these cities. Uh, so we we focused our analysis on uh, what, what the ABS calls statistical area three, uh, uh, which are essentially uh, functional economic regions where people typically uh, live, uh, live and work. So they, they typically would um, live in that region and go to work in the region. Uh, obviously there are some people who, who, uh, who work outside their region, but to a large extent, this definition encapsulates people who live and work within the region. Uh, the way economists think about cities and uh, optimal size of cities is, is uh, uh, involves two particular forces, centripetal forces and centrifugal forces. So that, that just basically uh, encapsulates the idea that there are certain forces that will attract businesses to co-locate. And then there are certain forces that will cause or uh, drive business, businesses to disperse. So in this case, uh, uh, forces that cause agglomer agglomeration are typically access to your customers, um, being close to your, your labor force um, and, and being able to leverage the benefits of uh, agglomeration. So the productivity benefits that you can get from being next to each other and being able to talk to each other and engage with, with each other. Um, by contrast, the forces of dispersion include things like congestion, pollution, and so on. Now, uh, in, in terms of determining a optimal size for a city, 
there isn't a one single optimal size. So that's the first answer from our analysis. Uh, but instead, you know, as, as economists typically say, it, it really depends. It really depends uh, whether your region is manufacturing specialized or whether it's um, services oriented. Uh, so there isn't one single size. So it, it depends on the specialization of your region. So on this chart, we've got here all of the major SA3 regions uh, across Australia. And you can see that Sydney and Melbourne are slightly above that optimal point. Um, not, not significantly, but a little bit above their, uh, th that optimal point. And when we mean Sydney and Melbourne here, we're referring to uh, Sydney inner city and Melbourne, um, uh, Melbourne city, which, which is typically um, Sydney and Melbourne LGAs, but slightly beyond that, that boundary. So that's how, uh, that's sort of the best way to think about those regions. Uh, you'll also see that there are some manufacturing focused regions like Bankstown, uh, Dandenong or Tullamarine Broadmeadows. Those regions are also slightly above their optimal size, estimated optimal size. Next slide, thanks Aaron. Um, and on this slide, we wanted to take a bit of a uh, cl closer look at Greater Sydney, just, just to sort of um, provide a view on what's happening in the, in the, in the growth areas as well uh, for, for, for this group, uh, for those of you from New South Wales. Uh, so as you can see, um, so the, the, the region that, that captures a Sydney CBD is, is in that green zone, so slightly above optimal, along with the parts of the um, more industrial uh, areas of, uh, of Sydney, including places like Mount Druitt, a little bit of Bankstown and, and uh, uh, Guildford, those sorts of areas out west. Uh, and uh, locations like Liverpool, uh, we've estimated to be at sort of optimal productivity maximizing size. Uh, so the, the, uh, overall, when you, when you look at this picture, I think that there, there's a clear message that there are some locations or some cities within uh, Greater Sydney that are suboptimal in their size, meaning that they're not, they're not at that scale in terms of employment density to be able to achieve that productivity maximizing peak size. Now, th this, doesn't, this doesn't necessarily mean that, um, you know, we, we just need a massive population burst or we pump people into these locations and, and everything will be, uh, will be fine. That, that's, not, uh, that, that's certainly not the sort of um, message that, we, that this analysis is, is pointing to. It's instead pointing to uh, um, a, a range of factors that uh, that cause and to to be below its um, optimal size. So, if for example you're you're better able to connect um, each of those SA3 regions, and you're you're better able to move people between those SA3 regions, get them in quickly to work, uh, and um, uh, there's lower congestion. Uh, if that were if that were certainly the case, then a lot of these regions would be closer to their optimal. Uh, productivity maximizing peak size. So in, in our analysis, we propose a set of uh, potential actions and solutions. Uh, and the first of course being uh, improving and investing in public transport, connecting people, uh, connect, connecting locations, connecting where uh, the places where people live and where they work. And this will really help reduce the productivity loss that you get from uh, excessive congestion and lost time during travel. So this is really important for uh, nearly all of those uh, locations that we had on the previous map, uh, for example, in Sydney. And this is true across many of our, uh, many of our major cities uh, across all of our states and territories. Improving housing affordability is another important uh, policy, uh, uh, policy response to achieve each region's productivity maximizing peak. The basic idea here is that we want people to be able to live close to where they work. And if you can't do this, you, you, you really are missing out on the productivity potential of your region. Uh, and there are obviously, you know, a, a whole range of uh, potential solutions uh, that can help address housing affordability, including addressing uh, tax settings, in, uh, things like inclusionary zoning uh, and, and a range of other potential options. And thirdly, we also thought that um, a broad-based land tax uh, replacing stamp duty uh, would be a good solution to, to, to also get people closer to their places of work. Next slide, thanks.
Um, so on, on this last slide, we, we, we just wanted to also touch on what we think are some options for local government to uh, help uh, regions uh, reach their productivity maximizing potential. Uh, so the, the first, of course, I think from a local government point of view is to, is to encourage decision makers and uh, encourage planners and, and economic development profession, prof uh, professionals to start thinking about uh, housing and employment lands um, uh, beyond uh, as, a, as a collective system. Uh, cities are complex, um, cities and regions are complex and they're dynamic systems and you have to start thinking about them uh, in a collective fashion um, beyond a singular focus on one or another. Uh, and the other, the other perhaps slightly controversial uh, idea here is uh, that um, we would strongly encourage um, uh, each local government area to think about uh, the importance of strategic centres which might even be outside the boundaries of, uh, of a given LGA. Uh, so if you start thinking about um, the strategic centers and strategic employment um, centers um, in your region, that's, be, that's perhaps outside your, the boundaries of your LGA, because not every single LGA can have a metro station and not, not, not every single LGA can be on a, on a um, uh, high, high, high flow train line. Uh, if you sort of target your thinking and your planning towards helping the, uh, the strategic center that is perhaps undersized in your region, that will really start help shaping uh, the way our cities and our regions perform in the future. Uh, and on housing affordability, I think, you know, local governments have, have, have the potential to, to play an important role there. Uh, particularly around inclusionary zoning and and um, and also pushing government, I think, both at the state and federal level, to start thinking about a, um, a really clear, coherent national cities policy and framework, which is really lacking at the moment as well. Uh, so those are just some some thoughts and ideas we had uh, for local governments and obviously state and federal governments going ahead. Uh, I might just leave it there. I know it's a bit of a bit of a quick one. Uh, so, a bit, bit of a quick run through our, our analysis uh, in, in, the, in the recent report, but I might throw to Aaron as well if he wanted to chime in and then open up for questions. Yeah, th there's probably just one thing I'd add to that, and, and it's, it's another piece of work that we've done on, on remote work um, for the Illawarra. And, and just the, some of the trends around that. Um, and we'll make sure that uh, we provide both of those pieces to Bronwyn. But the, the thing that was interesting about our piece for the Illawarra was starting to think about how um, remote work played into some of that productivity agenda as well. Um, it's obviously a really important part of getting more people into um, uh, to, to, into in good employment in, in growth regions. Now, um, the, at the same time, um, th there's always going to be some people who it's product productive uh, to, 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 to work in the inner city um, and uh, there's big agglomeration benefits from, from that as well. So um, it, it's important to make sure that we we're, uh, remain agile between making sure that we get people in and out of city, um, city centres back to their homes in, in growth regions, but also, you know, how can we... Um, make our regions attractive places to do remote work as that becomes both nationally and globally competitive. And so um, we'll send around the piece we did for the Illawarra as well, because I think that that would be of interest to a broader audience, especially in the outer verbs. Um, and I can see, Nahid, uh, we've got a request uh, for the map for, for Melbourne as well as Sydney. Um, uh, we don't actually have that to hand, <laughs> but uh, 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 it, it is possible for that to be created, but I suspect that somebody might have to buy it, unfortunately, because we'd have to do that again. Is that right? That's, I just, I'm 99% sure that's right based on what I saw in R. That, that's right, Aaron. We, I mean, the, the, the closest data to that we have publicly available in the report is, is that chart. There was, a, there was a chart which sort of had the, the dots uh, of, the, of the various cities. Uh, Victoria, Victoria left out again. I, uh, the, uh, uh, you don't want to get the South Australian started about, about that. I can, I can, um, I can promise you that that was uh, no parochial intent whatsoever. Simply my uh, current domiciled location influencing that choice. Yeah, I, I think um, just to. Um, 
the the broadly um, as you can tell from the the distribution of that that what what Mahi put on the screen we'll send it around and you can have that chart essentially that, that it, Melbourne looks quite similar it's essentially a donor um that is as, as well um we haven't mapped it out but you, you can see Burundara and a bunch of other places put picked out there and they're very similar in terms of its distribution um and the same is true um for the other five uh, the, the other four big cities as well so it's it's it, it roughly the same perhaps slightly less extreme thanks uh, could i ask a quick question then and it's around this you know cities policy national cities policy and we've seen um the Western Sydney City deal really achieved some fantastic things, but then we've seen others, other city deals sort of, um, well, the ones in Melbourne are struggling to get off the ground. Um, others, you know, you can question their impact and their breadth and, and depth. And so I just would love your thoughts on, on how the city deal model needs to evolve. How, how do we look at these sort of looking at housing and employment lands and inclusionary zoning and regional centres, are they all part of, of what we could do in a deal? Yeah, I might, I might um, sidestep an assessment about how well they're going. And I think sure. that um, the, the answer is that they're quite mixed. I think that yeah. um, some of the performance of the city deals in West, uh, it, it, yeah, Eritropolis is seems to be very strong. No, that um, the city deal in, Adelaide's much more focused, for example, and, and there's some performance there, and, and I know, and, and, and as described in, in in other places. So I think that uh, there's there's a there's a continuum about that. I, I, my personal view is probably that uh, it's it's really important to have all levels of government engaged in cities policy, and so I think that um, the the important thing here is that the, we have an acknowledgement from all levels of government that cities are, um, are, are really important economic drivers. Um, and, the, the, and, and, you know, to get to brass tacks, the, the, the level of government that waxes and wanes about that over time is the Commonwealth. And so sometimes the Commonwealth is very enthusiastic about cities and sometimes less so. And, and I think that going forward, as, as we become a more services driven economy, um, and um, we, we um, continue um, to be, to become um, more a more knowledge intensive economy where there's increasing agglomeration benefits of that and people gathering close together um, and 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 the, the the power of cities to drive our economic growth will will become ever stronger and we need a Commonwealth government um, that that's really deeply engaged in cities policy. I'm an economist, not a not a, uh, a, a pundit, so I'll, I'll leave it to others um, to to judge about exactly um, the the way that that's going. But I think that we should be asking the Commonwealth government to to, to be engaged in, in in this issue, and um, more, the more engagement, the better. Um, I also think um, that some of the old um, discussions about our uh, well, states fund X and the Commonwealth funds Y when it comes to particular infrastructure projects are pretty outdated. And so we need to make sure that um, the, the Commonwealth in, is really deeply engaged in all parts of the infrastructure network, um, which is you know why it's good to see things like their support for Gold Coast Light Rail and Metronet. When I worked in the Commonwealth government some years ago, then that may have been a, a level of controversy about the Commonwealth funding public transport infrastructure. I think it's a welcome thing to see that um, they're thinking in the past. I think the Commonwealth should, should, should be funding all kinds of, of transport infrastructure. Um, and it's and it's so 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 you, you, I think that. We've, we've been on a good path with some of that over the last 10 to 15 years. I don't know whether you, you Mahid's also a former federal government employee, so he, he might have some reflections on the same. So, I mean, I, I, th I think, I, I mean, I, you know, I don't disagree with what Aaron's saying and uh, having sort of, you know, have, both of us having spent time in the Commonwealth government, I think we can both attest to the fact that um, cities isn't sort of central to the thinking of the place. And that that's hugely problematic, mm -hmm. uh, which is why uh, I, I, in in the in the thought leadership report, you know, I, I sort of make reference to what Treasury typically calls the three P's: population, productivity, and participation. And uh, like the 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 main message we are advocating in, in that regard is to include place in there as a standalone P and make it the four P's. 
because at the moment there just isn't uh, it just isn't central to the thinking. Uh, the Center for Policy Policy at uh, Center for Population, sorry, at the Federal Treasury is a good start. Mm. Um, but again, like you, there just isn't that that sort of spatial dimension in their thinking at, at whatsoever. It's just uh, it is, su- is a, such a focus on aggregates in terms of the population as opposed to how the population is distributed and what that means at a, at a local and regional level. So I think that that's sort of where we need to go. Yeah, we're, we're trying to come at it from all levels in that respect because, um, you know, some of those projections, particularly at state level, are just so ridiculously out, um, you know, and to think that the number of schools or hospitals is being planned on, on you know, a number that might be 100,000 people um, fewer than are actually living there. It's mm. just, it's just um, not good enough, really. So, yeah. Well, well if, you, if, you, if you know any economics firms that do demographic predictions, uh, yeah. if you don't know any, we, we, if you don't know any, uh, give us a call. Uh, but, the, but I think that uh, the, 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 one, the one thing I'd say in the, in the defense of the Commonwealth government is that, is that, um, the, the, we need to make sure that the way, that the, there's a really strong commitment um, from state and local governments to getting um, this right for the right reasons. I think in the past, sometimes the Commonwealth scepticism of some of this debate is because um, they feel like um, that, that when this sort of um, when play, the discussion around place-based initiatives happens or whatever else, it's for reasons other than good policy, you know, whether that's marginal seat politics or, um, you know, interest groups within particular um, places. Um, but so I think that it's some, something that's very valuable that can come from a group like the um, Growth Area Alliance or the LGA or from um, uh, from state treasuries um, to, 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 to to really give an evidence-based argument, set, a set of arguments for these things that gets beyond some of the p- politics. Um, because I think that um, the, 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 the Commonwealth um, are just, are, are just, the Commonwealth are just like us. The, the, the Commonwealth government's made up of people who are trying to do the right thing for this country. And so the, their, their, skeptic, their, their skepticism is around making sure that they're getting their planning right. And I think that, um, in, in in their defence, um, there's a lot of um, the, 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 there's a lot of variable quality when it comes to this debate. So I think there's a really important role for, for you and your members to play. Here. Um, Sid Winnan has asked: Growth area economies are usually heard about by population serving sectors. With reforecast population projections being lower, what other sectors should growth councils look to stimulate, and what sectors are showing sign of opportunity? Um, but Sid, that's a really interesting question. I I, I think. Um, the, the first thing to say would be um, that the effect is uh, in the medium term on population um, is, is, is as yet unknown. And I think that somebody else in their question uh, or perhaps a comment in the chat made the point is that growth areas are often a second destination rather than a first. Um, and, uh, it, 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 and I think that that's an interesting point too. I, I also wonder whether um, there might be some element of rebalancing within metropolitan areas as a result of remote work. And so in, um, I haven't seen the data yet for Australia, um, but in, in other countries, there's been a bit of a discussion about people moving away from inner cities and into, reg- uh, into regional areas or into outer suburbs as they try to find more space. Um, anecdotally hear things about that happening. I, I, I actually don't want to speculate too much because I think that that trend could really go either way. Um, mm. But it, it, I think that it's a little too early to tell whether we need to re- rebalance our economies in, in the other regions. I think the other element to think about here is um, with the current level of demand around home builder and, and activity, um, the, 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 there may be some merit to a... Um, to, to uh, I guess, um, things returning more to normal. <laughs> and, and, and I know that um, even though we will need to make sure that we've got the activity for, to support the, that part of the economy um, into the medium term, um, I know that uh, if, I, I've spoken to many local governments, particularly planners, who would be keen if 
they got to some level of normality um, in their own lives, if, if nothing else. And so some stabilisation of that over time is to be expected. We're not going to see housing starts like we've seen in the last period. Um, uh, it, it, and, and so some normalisation of that will become important. Um, but, but I think the, the other element of filling the gap here is about remote work and, and, and doing what you can to foster that within your regions. Um, and uh, there, there, are, there are things you can do to attract them. I th and I think that's going to be, you know, a really key focus for our members. I know there's every economic development team across the country is looking at ways to, to embed remote working um, in their local economy. So um, we do need to wrap up. So thank you all very much for your time. And we will circulate presentations. And I'll just give a little plug to um, have a look at our website. We have open registrations for our symposium. And um, we'd really love um, as many of you to join us as, as you can for that. So thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Mahid. That was a really great conversation. And um, thank you to everyone for joining in. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Al. Thanks for having us. See ya. Bye-bye. Thank you.